Plus, I'm using a Mac, so I have to keep looking to the left to see where my slides is. Uh, well, thank you very much for staying. Uh, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist or... Uh, that's not me, right? Uh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to share some of the, the lessons I learned by working in the entertainment industry, and hopefully some of my experience might be useful for you guys. Um, so I started that game company uh, 11 years ago, so it's been a long time. I'm still very passionate about doing what, I'm, what I love. Um, we made commercial games on the PlayStation in the past. There's Flow, Flower, uh, Journey, and we just announced our new game, Sky, uh, on the Apple event this, sep this September. Um, it's called Sky. Um, in the past, we've won a lot of awards in the industry. Um, here are the trophies. Uh, we also break two Guinness records as the most critically acclaimed game and the highest Metacritics. Um, but that's not what I'm most proud of. I, I, I really feel proud when our game was first chosen as a collection of exhibition in MoMA. Uh, our second game, Flower, is also the first permanent collection by the Smithsonian as a video game. Um, our game, Journey, was the first game ever nominated for Grammy, competing with like you know uh, all the movie soundtracks. Um, to me, I see game just as a new form of entertainment medium, and I want to see it to be treated equally as film, music, novel and everything. So many people innovate in the game industry based on technology, uh, art style, um, game mechanics. But we treat games as an emotional experience. And that's kind of like what differentiates us from other companies. Um, to me, uh, I got this idea of using emotion as a lens while I was still in school. I went to the USC School of Cinematic Arts uh, one of the top film schools in the, in the country. Um, what I discovered is that many people think about entertainment as this kind of place of vanity, you know, and money, but really it's just a food industry. You know, when we are hungry or thirsty, there's all kinds of food we have a craving for. And same thing with emotion. You know, entertainment is emotional food. You know, if I just break up, you know, I'm really sad, I want something to cheer me up, Oh, I want something to make me even sadder so I can come out from the other end. Um, if you look at you know, books or theme parks, roller coasters, movies, in the end, it gives you an emotional fulfillment. And if we use cinema as a kind of a mature emo uh, entertainment medium, you can see the industry divide itself based on emotional content. You know, just think about the, the genre of a movie, right? Uh, a horror film is based on the scary feeling. A romantic film is based on the warm, fuzzy, lovely feelings. And each of these uh, emotions have different sides of the market. You know, the top four is action, uh, adventure, and uh, uh, comedy and drama. These are the biggest emotional market in film. And if you look at how film industry divide their emotions, and you can see around summer, when the young audience graduate, well, maybe having a summer break, they, they like to watch uh, uh, action adventures here. But around winter, um, you know, the, the holiday time, the drama becomes more popular. And uh, certainly in Halloween time, this pink thing is the horror film genre, just suddenly peak, right? And so it's just so intuitive to think about, oh, we have different craving of feelings, even based on the seasons. Um, but this is the genre of video games. Uh, you can't read it, that's fine. You know, typically they have a uh, role-playing game, and then they have a massively, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And what's the difference between the two? Well, the other one uses online technology, right? And they have a shooting, shooter game, and then they have a third-person shooter game. What's the difference in feeling? No difference, but technology is different. One is first person, one is third person, right? And you, you, you would say, oh, I want to I wanna get a, a shooter game. But then you would say, is it the funny shooter game like No One Lives Forever, or is it a scary shooter game like Doom, right? So 
video game started as a software simulation industry. You know, you simulate golf, you simulate driving a car. It was, it was a software industry. And for a long time, we, we call video game players as users, and that's a software industry term. But certainly as we grow up, you know, game is no longer just a simulator. You know, it creates feelings. It could come close to the realm of art. And so I really think the industry needs to mature. You know, it's, it's still in its infancy. It's only 40 years. Um, so if we map all the video game that's currently popular on the market onto the emotional chart of film, you can see there's a lot of action, strategy, you know, there's a lot of scary stuff. And that's pretty much it. Um, and why is that? Um, personally, I think these very strong primal emotions like fear and excitement, they are very appealing to the younger generations. Uh, but as you grow older, what is comedy? Comedy is a cocktail of emotions. You don't laugh just at something scary. It's usually someone's about to kill you, it's so scared, but then they relief, release it. You know, it's like, oh, that's just a joke, and then you kind of laugh. Um, drama is another way of cocktail of emotions. Drama is always about the transformation of a character. You know, you started this way, but through a roller coaster ride of feelings, eventually at the end of the drama, you become someone else. And these two particular genres are missing in the game industry. And I think that there's something about this vicious cycle because young, younger boys like, like video games, so the review industry would review things that really appeal to that audience. And then the developer will try to make a game that's having higher score by the, by the critics. So, you know, console video game has become this, you know, 97% male, young audience. Um, and then people are like, how come we don't have any other games like, you know, that could potentially appeal to female or maybe to older audience? And I would say that's just a, uh, that's just a stage of development, because when film first came out, in the first 40 years of film, before Citizen Kane, people are just still trying to figure out what they can do with this technology. So initially, they're just trying to shoot whatever the traditional media is trying to, shoot, trying to present. You know, people on the stage fighting, or there's a ballet, or maybe an opera. Um, and most of the early film is appealing to these primal emotions. Because it, it's really easy to sell, right? Um, Lumiere Brothers, you know, the French cinema people, bring film to Russia for the first time, and they showed it in the theater, and they showed this footage of a train coming into the station. And half of the theater, at, at least in the report, run out of the theater thinking that they're going to get hit, they're scared. And that created a huge impact. And if you look at today, VR, right? Like virtual reality, what is the most talked about and <laughs> spread experiences that tend to have a lot to do with these strong emotions. Um, so when we start that game company, I have one goal. I want it to mature the medium, so it's not just appealing to young boys. I want it to be just like other media, like, like other artistic form that could appeal to new emotions. And so my goal is to be the centrum, you know, bring a new nutrition to the industry. Right? And so that could also not only make the, the portfolio of video game more healthy, but also make a gamer who plays game from morning to the night have something different. Uh, so I started to going against the trend of the media. Right? Grand Theft Auto was very popular back in 2007. I'm trying to make a game that is the anti-Grand Theft Auto. Uh, so uh, in, in the school of cinema, we often say, you know, a, a, a believable character, they usually talk about what they want, but they are usually wrong about they, what they truly need. And that's very much the same thing for, uh, you know, consumer research. If you do a focus group, you invite a bunch of gamers, you say, what kind of game do you want? They'll say, oh, I like these, you know, explosive games. I want bigger guns, faster cars, you know, like, that's what the consumer typically wants. But from our perspective, we can evaluate what they say and really figure out what they truly need. And I think if a person plays these fighting games that's very stressful from morning to the night, what they need really is a kind of a peaceful experience. So I grew up in Shanghai, which is the huge concrete jungle on the right, and I first came to California driving on the I-5, 
I saw this green field of you know, rolling nature, and I was just like, I've never seen these, this many nature for me. It's like the person who grew up in the desert and first come to the sea. And it was an overwhelming experience. So I wanted to capture this feeling of harmony, of peace that I, I, I sensed while I was in nature. Um, and that became my goal to create a game. Um, but to create a new emotion is very difficult. It's all about research and development. Um, so initially, I, I created, using technology, I created a simulation of the field of a flower. Within two weeks, right, we have this field. And people come in like, wow, this is amazing. This is beautiful. But the constant feedback I got from uh, Sony, which was the publisher for the game, was, this is not fun. You know? Where's the challenge? Right? Game should be fun. Game should be challenging. And you just fly in the field of flower? What is that? That's not a game. And so we caved, and we decided to add some challenge to the game. And then what happened is, as people start to engage in challenging activities, they start to curse. You know, just think about it. If, if you want to throw a basketball into a, a, a hoop, and you miss and it bounces out, it feels frustrating, right? But I wanted to make a game that communicate peace. And so no matter how I change the challenge from one type of challenge to the other type of challenge, gamers always curse. And I just can't imagine someone who would be in a peaceful and harmony experience cursing at themselves. And so I start to really work on, um, OK, the slides is, is wrong order, but let's see if I can find it. OK, maybe, maybe that slide is gone. OK, all right. So I actually worked on 12 different prototypes. And we're trying to go against the trend. We, we're trying to remove the challenge and see if we can still come up with something engaging. It took us 14 months. Right? I, I spent two weeks to make the field of flower, but it took me 14 months to try all the different combinations of interactivities and try to find one that's not frustrating, but actually give you a sense of you know, uh, trends. And so eventually, we had this combination of you know, music, rhythm game combined with exploration, very, very light puzzle. Um, and the key is, when we are creating these feelings, we have to make it intense. And it's really easy to work with traditional medium, like artists, you know, who, if you, know, if you, if you shoot a film, you have a production designer, which is also called the art director. You would tell them, hey, um, in this flower experience, there were this particular area it's not the most highest climax, but we wanted to feel a little bit depressed. Can you give me a painting? Uh, showcase this area. And he could give me a concept art within two hours. And you'll feel kind of just the right amount of depression, but people still have hope to continue. And when I work with the composer, and I say, hey, I, I need this music. It's, it's depressive, but hopeful. He can basically play it out of his keyboard within five seconds. He's like, oh, it's just like that movie combining with this, and it's amazing. And, and then I work with designers, right? Game designers are just you know, interactive designers. They design what the player puts in and what the computer spits out, right? That's, that's where the new craft is. I say, hey, let's design this game. That's not fun at all. That's depressive. But people can't give up. And you look back at the history of all the games. Nothing is like that. And they just kind of scratch their head, and we just keep trying. It's just like searching in the dark. You know? and, and eventually, after 14 months, usually most of the game will be canceled after 14 months if you don't know what you're doing. But we were a small group of students out of school. You know, we had minimal wages. So we just keep going. And eventually, we find this game. Uh, yeah, here's the slides I was talking about. Um, and so this is a teaser done by MoCA Los Angeles. They were doing a documentary about video game as uh, contemporary art. Is there a sound for this? Oh, it's, it's there. Um, so they showed me this te teaser. They were like, oh, you've got you to gotta love this teaser. I'm like, these are a bunch of artsy people pretending they're playing games. Why should I like this? And they say, no, 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 they are the people who work in the museum playing your game. We mounted your game on top of a camera. I said, really? Uh, 
So it's kind of like a slow motion close up of how the player feel when they are playing your game. I was like, they must be acting, right? They, they don't look like a normal gamer. But they're not nerdy at all. Uh, but here you can see they have the PlayStation controller in their hands. So, so they're really playing this flower game, right? So to me, it's like really surprising to see the emotion going on their face. Uh, OK, we can bring the light back. Um, so the other thing we noticed is when we create these new emotions, suddenly new people are coming, the gamers who, well, they're not gamers, but people who never play games were like, whoa, I want to try that. You know, this is beautiful. I, I want to try this experience. And then they saw the controller of PlayStation. There's like 21 buttons on that thing. They were like, uh, how am I supposed to touch this? Uh, so we have to, you know, I realize is that as you expand the audience, you can't treat everybody as if they know everything about the medium. So what we did is we removed all the buttons, right? So any button you press, it's the same thing. Uh, you just use the tilt. This is before iPhone came out, so the motion controller. And so I can show you a video. This is a kid who has uh, Down syndrome. His uh, older brother sent this video to us. He was really moved that his younger brother can't really play most of the games because they require reading and learning, but this game was very intuitive, and even his younger brother can play. Um, Yeah, so in this game, you fly around as the wind, and any flower you touch, they bloom, and they, a petal fall out of the flower to join you. And uh, anywhere you go, you spread light, uh, life, and color, and positive things. So, um, OK, so Flow uh, is, is our first game. Oh, thanks. Here's a you know, visitor playing Flow in MoMA. You know, here's people playing flower in Smithsonian Museum. And our journey game was also in many of the contemporary art museum. Um, and so journey is a, kind of like my masterpiece, which was the one that broke the Guinness record. Uh, when we were trying to do this game, this is right after flower, I was like really satisfied that we made a new emotion and people love it. And, and we were thinking, can we create a sense of connection between two people who have never met? through an emotional experience in the game media. Um, so today, most of the popular game franchise is kind of like centered around power fulfillment, you know, power fantasy. Because that's what the young boy wants. You know, you're in the middle school, high school, you have no power, no freedom, you don't have a car, you can't drink, you can't drive, <laughs> you know, you, you have to go to school. What do you want the most emotionally? It's very easy to think. I want to be, break free. I want to feel like I, I can change the world. And so most of the superhero movies is all about like a random guy, usually the, the, the victim of a bully, suddenly got a superpower, and they can change the entire world, but hopefully for the positive side. Uh, and so most of the game is about you acquiring more and more power to execute more and more power onto the environment. And as a result, any type of multiplayer game, the, the end result is, how am I applying my power on this other player who is online? It's like if, if you put Batman and Superman together, the only thing people can think about is who's more powerful, right? Um, but what I want to see in the game is people genuinely caring about each other's feelings. They are having an emotional exchange, you know? Right? And, and stuff like this happening in real life. But in video game, that's just not possible. <laughs> right? And so I, I have to kind of change that interactions between people. But how can we do that? Most of the video game is like this. There's explosions and actions all over the place. Like if someone say, hey, uh, you want to go out with me? That's not going to happen in the battlefield. So the first thing we thought is we have to reduce the number of actions right, and distractions. So we're like, OK. No guns, uh, no power in their hand. Uh, but then what happened is they are verbally abusing it to each other. You know, we lock a bunch of people in a virtual world, they start talking shit at each other. Uh, it's, you know, it's like any forum or online you know, uh, you know, comment. And so we were like, mm, that's not right. We have to set up the tomb. Uh, so we decided to put them into a very kind of dangerous place, like a desert, and kill a bunch of, kill the majority of people. Uh, 
And so what do I notice is when I go out on a, you know, a hike? Um, because most of the time you're in nature, you, you saw signs warning there's bear, right? And you kind of like get scared, you feel that small. And then you run into another person walking up. I notice 100% people I met in hiking are friendly, <laughs> right? At least they will say hi or they will say, oh, be careful, I, I think I saw the bear. Uh, but in, if you go to uh, Times Square, that's, that's just not going to happen. If someone tried to talk to you in Times Square, you were like, are you trying to, you know, rob me? Uh, you know, like, are you trying to go through some scam? Why are you talking to me? Right? Um, so what I realized is that we have to use emotion to break up the ice and change people's attitude. You know, one emotion is power fantasy. I want to have more power. Oh, there's another person. He's also getting more power. I s immediately feeling aggressive or competitive. So in this game, what we're trying to do is connecting people is we actually have to evoke the opposite emotion, which is to feel powerless. It's to feel small. It's to feel not knowing everything. Um, and that's the sense of awe. Uh, so how do we evoke sense of awe? Like typically online games have names, right? And they tend to take you out of the experience. And this is the online interface of Journey. Uh, you, you have nothing to distract you out of the experience itself. There's no names. Everybody's anonymous. There's no chatting. There's no text. It's just you and the other person, tiny person in a giant world, and who are going to the mountain. Um, we review you the name of these players only after the entire experience is over. So during the whole time, you don't know who they are. Um, and what we are trying to do, you know, like if you have been working in a big corporation, I bet you at some point there's a corporate training program take you and all your coworkers into doing some kind of physical exercise to bond you guys together, right? Like challenge how people bond together. So I thought, well, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a storyteller. What if I give you the biggest challenge of all time? Wouldn't I bond you with another person? Very well. Um, so here's a term of, of catharsis. It's a theatrical term. You know, it's like if we can create an emotion that is so overwhelming, so unexpected, that after the emotion, you actually have a sense of he healing and revitalization. I personally, as a you know, big movie fan, I've seen many great movies that put me in that state for days, sometimes weeks, to think about what just happened. And often I discover coming out of these cathartic experience, I've learned a lot. And so to achieve cathartic experience is a pretty simple idea. You know, in Hollywood, we call it creating a three-act structure. So cathartic comes from the climax of the end. So you need a low moment in the middle. And to make you feel low, you need a fake uh, victory at the beginning. So pretty much every Hollywood movie is like that. Um, but then to evoke the sense of awe and mystery, I rely on Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. And he's the master of big data. Well, before big data was popular, he's, he locked himself in a, in a cabin in the mountain, reading full time, 10 hours a day for 10 years. He read every single literature that has been, trans, been uh, left. And by East, West, and you know, Middle East, all the mythical stories. And he found this pattern called the hero's journey pattern. Uh, you should look it up if you're interested in you know, feeling of you know, kind of transcendence. I think hero's journey is very much tied to that. It's pretty much the pattern of human transformation. Uh, and many of the film has been using hero's journey uh, to a very successful uh, extent. And so my understanding of this particular pattern Joseph Campbell has found is the pattern of transformation. It doesn't have to be a, a person, a hero's journey, uh, you know, like Aragon started as a drunk in, the, in, the, in, a, in a bar and eventually become the king, right? It, it could be something as small as breaking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. It could be giving up the job. Um, so when I try to create this particular hero's journey slash catharsis. I was going for the moon, so I thought I'm gonna do 
a life from birth to death. And surprisingly, the hero's journey and the stage of life and the Hollywood three-act structure, they, they match perfectly. I, that was like a big surprise when I find them. Um, the stage of life is based on Confucius' understanding of the different stage of you growing up, you know, mastering things and transcend. And so I, I divide this hero's journey and I'm, I design it faithfully. And I even design a different stage of life and choose the colors and the environment. Even the altitude of the world is tied to the emotional arc. Um, so I'm like, this has got to work, right? So th this is the trail of journey. when you run into another player online who you would never know what their true name is. So when we launched the game, uh, it's, uh, it's not done yet here. Uh, you, you can imagine most of the online player, particularly the people who play consoles, they are pretty mean to each other. You know, they're playing these shooter games. After you kill them, they will be like squatting on their corpse, right? These, these same kids were apologizing on a forum to say, hey, whoever that person is, uh, I don't know your name, but I hope you can see this forum. I'm leaving a message. I'm sorry. I'm leaving. My mom caught me, we have to go, right? I have to abandon you, right? I mean, it's not a typical uh, video game brat's behavior. Uh, but, but by using the design and using the emotion, we, we can turn them into someone suddenly, hmm, he's actually a decent human being. Um, and so here are a bunch of fan art. People draw what they remember from the game. You know? So at the end, when both of you are almost at the end of your life, one person would say goodbye to the other person by drawing a snow in the, in the sand. Um, you know, people would remember the beautiful moment during their teenage time, you know, the first spark of love. They would remember during the midlife crisis, you know, they don't know where to, to go, but there is a mentor saving them, helping them. They remember when they get older, their body becomes deteriorated, you know, but they can still rely on each other to get warmth. Right? These are all the emotions we're trying to evoke in the game and they remembered because we are going for it. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about the fan letters. Uh, so after Journey, that was 2012, uh, I've been working on a new game. I can't talk too much about it since uh, it's not out yet. Um, but I'm just going to show you a teaser. Um, oh, actually, uh, no, the, the, before the teaser, this, this is a game I want people to play with their family. Uh, many people who played Journey was like, I want to play this game with my wife or my daughter, but PlayStation, there's only one PlayStation at home. You need multiple PlayStation to play uh, multiple Journey. So I thought, can I create that emotional experience in the same household with many people participating? Um, so we just re released this little uh, game uh, teaser uh, in September. So it's only, uh, it's, a, it's a game about light and dark. Uh, it's also a game about hope. Uh, and this is a game you can play with up to eight people in your household or online at the same time.
It's a teaser, it's just a mood. There's not much star right there. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs>